So I'm now going to talk about pure effects and complementaries, complementarities, and I want to talk about how to model them in a network. I want to talk about empirical, um, uh, how economic theory can give um, uh, restrictions that allow for the estimation of some of the common empirical network models that get estimated from time to time. Um, now, um, again, um, I have a lot of notes, and I was looking at them last night and figuring out how to find a way to shorten them. So I took out the complementarities part um, because um, so Sanjeev yesterday described a linear network model right, um, in which there were complementarities. Another linear network model, and I, I think you described it as well, but I'm not sure, I don't remember, was having to do with pure effects, right? And say something like quadratic distance or something like that. Now, um, you know, um, uh, and I will show you um, how those models in some particular sense are observationally indistinct, um, and so that you can't identify one from the other later on, if I remember, okay? Um, and um, so uh, I don't think it's a big deal to talk about only one. Okay, um, and we should remember they're very different stories. Um, and I also think, by the way, that, that it's, 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 it's not often that we're actually asking the question, is it a complementarity or is it a you know, conformity effect or some kind? Normally, at, at some level, we've already decided that before we run the regression we want to run. So I don't think that this is a deep problem um, for the literature. Um, now, um, what I had done uh, was to put these two things, network externalities and social norms, into red, is to say that these are the things that I'm going to talk about, as opposed to information and social learning, which I'm not. However, my notes actually have a lot of stuff on social learning, and I will talk about them if I have time, although I doubt that I will. Um, I'm about to talk about network externalities, and my notes also have a big section on social norms. So, um, uh, in other words, this black signifies nothing at all, okay? Uh, uh, and now here is a, uh, a common regression, okay, um, that one often sees or things like it. And, um, so, um, um, let me back up and say one thing first. If we think about 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 these three um, categories here, um, it's. Um, um, it's good to understand that all three of these things can be going on in any particular social interaction at the same time, okay? Um, and I think we tend to say, well, this is a complementarity story, this is a peer effect story, this is social learning, all of these things. So let me give you an example. So suppose that I want to um, 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 uh, learn, um, so I want to study, um, and this will be my canonical story for this section of the lecture, um, I want to study, uh, um, education, okay? And I want to study educational outcomes in a classroom. Well, one story is that students actually learn from their classmates, okay? And consequently, if I have a, a classmate um, who exerts extra effort, right, um, then that classmate learns stuff, and of course I then learn from my interaction with him, right? And so that's a positive externality, those who work hard through this, just because maybe we study together or something like that, it creates a positive externality. Um, um, our friends do better as well. What kind of effect is that? Is that a pure effect? Is it a, is it a, is it a social norm? Is it a, is it a complementarity effect? Is it a pure effect? Social conformity, what do you think? Wow, I've asked a question, no one knows the answer. So let me say that again, right? Pardon? Pure effect? Well, all right, so I wanted to, so, so by, by saying, let me say, is it, is it conformity? or which is the usual way we model pure effects, is a conformity, or is it a complementarity in production, or, um, uh, or in a complementarity in effort, or, or, or something else. So again, the story is, is, that, is that I study with my friend. Um, my friend has put in extra effort last night, really knows this material well, um, uh, and therefore this helps me when we study together. What do you think? Well, I want to know which that story is. I can write down a model that encompasses them all, but the story I told, I think, is only one. Right? I mean, it's, it, it, so, so a peer effect would be that I am studying because it's my friend, and therefore I'm hanging out with him. But that's not what I told in the story, right? The, the story that I, I, I told was that I am actually benefiting from my friend's effort, right? So that is exactly a complementarity, right? 
On the other hand, it could well be, and this is where, 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 where I think what you're thinking, is that, is that, well, why am I studying? I'm studying because my friend is studying, you know, and, 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 um, um, uh, uh, and therefore, this, you know, and, and, and I feel the pressure to do what my friend does. This is clearly a conformity effect, right? Um, by the way, uh, complementarities could be negative. Suppose that I'm in a classroom with a very disruptive student, okay? And that disruptive student takes up a lot of teacher's time, right? Because it takes up a lot of teacher's time, teacher's spending less time teaching all the rest of us, right? And therefore, because of the disruptive student, right, my work, you know, my, my, outcome, my, out, my outcome falls, right? So that's a negative complementarity, okay? So now we've got two complementarities. We have one, one um, uh, you know, one pure effect. Um, uh, uh, another thing is it's not just hanging out with my friends, but it could be that I feel, I feel pressure right, to, um, uh, to, um, to actually, um, you know, perform as well as my pr friends perform, right? So there's a national exam in chemistry when I was in high school, right, in the United States, and I took this national exam, and I was sitting, sitting with a bunch of friends, um, and everyone was talking about what they got on the exam, and there were these people, and they'd all gotten the top score, right, on the exam, right? They got 800 on the exam. And in those days, the exams were graded in a much finer way than they're graded now. And I was embarrassed to announce my score, which was only a 798 out of 800, right? Because a pencil went awry, right? This is a pure effect. This is, right, this is horrible, right? Um, so these are, these, are, these are pure effects, right? Um, another social, what about, what about uh, you know, another, another um, I, can, I can go on and on with this, and I can spin social norm stories as well about falling in with a bad crowd. I mean, the di distinction between peer effects and social norm effects is a little, is, 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 is in some sense arbitrary, I think. There are some things that are kind of, because how are social norms enforced? Well, social norms are often, you might think about peer effects as a production model for social norms, right? There are a lot of ways in which social norms actually get enforced, get displayed, and one of these is through peer pressure. Right? So these distinctions are kind of complicated. Um, so I want to talk anyways about a, um, a regression that we, um, that, that, um, uh, we often see. So um, omega i here is a choice variable, so let's let this be um, 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 effort. How hard, you know, how hard you study. And uh, we've got a, um, um, a vector of individual correlates. By the way, I'm going to presume that all these vectors are, in fact, one-dimensional because it's easier to talk about. Okay? So I'm going to assume that there's a single, there's a, there's a, there's a correlate, uh, um, might be family income or something like that. Um, my effort also depends upon the group average of, individual, of this individual correlate. Maybe I'm so mean wealth of the class or mean income of my classmates. There's going to be other group effects in this classroom, like the quality of the teacher. That's going to be YG, okay? And then um, finally, there's going to be some un unobserved individual effect that is, that is, that is pushing me. Um, so uh, the first person I know of who actually, I now know of someone who did this earlier. I used to say that the first person I know of who ran a regression like this um, uh, was Linda Datcher in 1982. Um, she has a paper called Effects of Community and Family Background on Achievement in the Review of Economics and Statistics. Um, but in fact, I came across an earlier regression like this um, uh, that was done back in the, in the late 1970s, but I can no longer remember who did it. Okay, so um, um, uh, we'll have to let that go. Um, now, um, this model has a name. This is called the linear in means model, right? Because um, for reasons that will become apparent um, uh, soon. And this is kind of the most common an exemplar from the most common class of models that are estimated in the empirical uh, social interactions literature, in particular labor economists, have run lots of regressions like this. Um, and, um, and what I want to do is I want to take this model and I want to unpack it. I want to reverse engineer it. Okay? Um, and in particular, the issue is how do we, one of the issues we want to answer is, well, how do we know if a peer effect is present? Okay? And what Linda Datcher did when she ran this regression was to say, well, let's look at pi 2. If pi 2 is, is, is positive, is non-zero, that's evidence for a peer effect, okay? Um, now, from what I've said already, you can guess that, that, that that's evidence of some kind of externality, but whether it's a peer effect or something else 
can't be really determined from this, right? And so that's why we want to unpack this model a little more. We can't fault her, it was 1982, okay. Um, so I'm now gonna construct, uh, I'm gonna reverse engineer this model a little bit, and the reverse engineering I'm gonna do um, is um, uh, just co copied out of a paper written by Chuck Mansky in the Review of Economics and Studies, I believe, Review of Economic Studies, 1995, called The Reflection Problem. Um, and, um, um, and, uh, uh, and here it is. So here we have, in a sense, an equilibrium model for the class, right? The equilibrium model for the class says that um, the following. Um, it says that the outcome or the, or the, the effort, the choice variable, um, is linear, and it depends upon my individual correlate. It also depends upon gr these group correlates. So this is the direct effect or contextual effect that I was talking about earlier, that wealthy parents maybe contribute more in the way of public goods to the classroom. That's, that's what Delta's picking up. It also depends upon my estimate of what everybody else is doing. Okay, that's the pure effect. Okay, uh, and then we've got a, you know, your usual random term at the end. Um, and now we have another behavioral equation. So this is a behavioral equation, okay? We've got another behavioral equation that sort of, it's an accounting equation really, right? That simply says is that the, 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 the group average or the, the, the group variable here is simply the average of the individual correlates, fine, okay? Um, and then we have the equilibrium condition that says that my expectations are in fact correct, right? Um, that, that my estimation uh, or my belief about group average behavior is in fact equal to the expectation of, what, of, of the average of what everybody in the group is choosing. So that's an equilibrium condition, right? So um, this, is, this is really an equilibrium. It is not, by the way, a game theoretic model, right? You don't see any, any maximization going on, right? Um, but this is an equilibrium model, right, nonetheless, okay? Now, if you write down the reduced form of this model, here's what you get, right? And the point is, is that, is that what I really want to do is if I want to talk about the, the, what, the presence of a peer effect, I want, the question I want to ask is can gamma be identified? And in the reduced form, gamma clearly cannot be identified. There's no way of backing out gamma. Is that clear? Right. So this is what Mansky refers to as the reflection problem. Right. So he wrote this paper in 1990. Um, it's easy to say what the effect of that has been, but, 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 but um, all right, so, so I, I, I can, what I can say is, is, that, is that what's really going on, of course, and I hope this is what you're hinting at, but you should jump in if I do a bad job here. Right, so, so what's going on here, right, is that, is that how does the, how does the, 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 um, uh, the uh, uh, individual, how does individual, so the problem is I, that I've got gamma and delta interacting with each other. Okay, why are gamma and delta interacting with, and, and the beta is playing a role here, but it's really gamma delta. What's the problem, right? Uh, in fact, I can, I, can, um, uh, I can identify beta. Beta's not the problem, right? But what's the problem here? The problem is, is that individual J's family income has two effects on me, right? It has an effect directly through the public good, okay? And it has an effect indirectly through raising my estimate, right, of what individual, how individual J is going to conform, per, perform, and therefore the standard that I have to achieve, right? Or, or so it's going to have this indirect effect through, oops, through, um, uh, is it there? Is it gone? Oh, there it is, through uh, uh, mu vi. So there is the direct effect, um, uh, which is called, which Mansky refers to as the contextual effect, and then, and then, and then, X also, XJ also works um, indirectly through the pure effect, through its direct effect on person J, that then, through its own effect on person J, thus the beta, which then has a pure effect on me, okay? Um, and I can't untangle those, um, and that's the source of the identification problem. Is that, does that help? Okay, yes? Uh, 
Well, I, I think that's a fancy way of restating the fact that there are these different channels through which X works, right? Yeah. And in the reduced form, right, the only thing I see is Xi, Xg, and omega i, right? So, so the only way that, that, that I see Xj, I can't, there it is, is through Xg, right? Yeah. X, and, 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 and that has... Um, and that has these different impacts, right? Simultaneous impacts, right? So how do I untangle those? That's, that's the source of the identification problem. Okay, so... Um, um, uh, so uh, if we think about this, right? Um, this is... Uh, here's actually the system that I want to... So here's a generalization of the model. I want to move to a generali generalization of the model. And the generalization of the model looks like this. Um, uh, and I've now put primes on these things just to indicate the following. When I made these slides, I um, took slides out of a, another slide pack that I have, and I used the same Greek letters in different ways. And I didn't want to, I was running out of Greek letters that I knew, okay? So I'm using these primes just to say that, that, that we're, hold to these only for a minute, and then we're going to forget about them. But here's an example of a general linear network model. Okay, so what is the idea here? Um, the idea here is that I'm not now going to take a simple average, but I'm going to take some, some, some weighted averages, right? So, so in the network model that I described, I care about the, there's this direct effect, which is the average of everybody's, in, you know, everybody's, say, family income. Well, instead of doing that, let me take, um, oops, um, uh, let me let CIJ denote the, the um, uh, influence of um, person J's wealth directly on person I, okay? So before that was one over N, or yeah, it was one, or, yeah, it was one over N, and now it's, 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 um, um, it's, it's the CIJ, okay? Um, and then similarly, um, instead of just taking a straight average of everybody else in the, um, uh, in the population, right, uh, for, for their expected omegas, I'm now going to weight some individuals differently, right, so that some people are my friends, I want to, I'm influenced by them, I'm not influenced by other people, right? So uh, that's what AIJ here is, is, is picking up, all right? So you can see already how am I going to represent these things. I've got now two social networks going on, okay? One social network is the pure effect social network, okay? And this is, in fact, a weighted adjacency matrix, all right? And I'm going to be a little bit more consistent and say that, the, that I am not influenced by my expectation of my average, okay? Which is to say that I'm going to take AII equal to zero. That, that seems only sane, okay? Similarly, I'm going to say that my family's contribution to the public good is captured in my family's own effect. That's part of beta prime. And therefore, CII is also going to be zero, okay? So... Now what I've done is I've actually just described the general linear model with these two distinct social networks, one which mediates or distributes um, contextual effects, right, this public good kind of thing, and the other of which actually measures the pure effect. And this is a model that I would like to estimate, okay? And in particular, maybe I don't care, so, you know, um, so I want to estimate this model. In particular, the question that I want to ask is, how big are the pure effects? I'm going, to, I'm going to normalize this model so that the weights all sum to one, so that I'm taking averages just that I did before, as I did before, but now I'm just letting the weights in the average vary. That's the only difference, okay? So this is, in fact, a, just a generalization of the previous model that we saw, and you'll notice that, that this is an instance. The following equation, if your econometrics textbook doesn't have this equation, throw it away, right? This is, right, the general linear model, except usually that's a Y, and sometimes there's a Z. I don't understand why the, relate, the, the notation is weird, but, and they always use Greek letters, capital Greek letters. So this is an instance of the general linear model, okay? Now, the questions I'm interested in, though, I don't want to know every parameter, right? Um, some of these parameters I might already know, right? Um, and what I want to ask then is how do we, I want to ask questions of the following form. I want to know how I interpret the regression parameters up here. Um, what kinds of restrictions on the coefficients are going to be reasonable restrictions, right? What kind, I, I need, I need um, you know, in general, 
we know that the general linear model is not identified. We need some restrictions, right? And so we talk about exclusion restrictions or other kind of coefficient restrictions necessary to, gen to, 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 to identify the model, right? Um, uh, so what kind of restrictions on the coefficients are reasonable, and do they, in fact, lead to identification of what I want to know, okay? Now, in particular, what I want to know is, are pure effects present, and, and what is their magnitude? Um, and I would also like to know about um, how big are pure effects relative to contextual effects. So these are the things that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm after. Um, now, in order to answer these questions, basically, I need a theoretical foundation of some kind. Okay? Um, and um, so let me, let me actually quickly describe a model that does this. Um, Here's a model that does this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build an incomplete information game. And it's a quadratic incomplete information game. And I'm going to assume that everybody has, every individual is described by a type vector that has two components. Um, one component is the observable, what I'll call the public type or the observable type. This is, for example, family income. Okay. The other component is some private type, right? something that I don't see, maybe an individual's kind of willingness to make some effort. Okay, so the point is, is that Xi is publicly observable to everybody playing the game and to the econometrician, okay, um, and Zi is observable only to person I, okay. So this is an incomplete information game. I, I am sure that all of you have had a game theory course, right? Um, everyone here is reasonably advanced as a graduate student, right? So I can talk about the Harsanyi prior and no one is going to faint. There's a Harsanyi prior, okay? That's the end of the Harsanyi prior. Um, Okay, so the type space is of size. If I have i individuals, the type space is of dimension, is, is of dimension to i. Um, uh, actions, of course, are these real, valuable, real variables. Um, uh, and I've described a payoff function here. What does this payoff function say? This payoff function says the following. I have a private cost to my own action, right, which is theta i omega i minus one half omega i squared. So the point is, is that my marginal cost, my marginal private cost of taking an action is, is uh, linear in omega i. It's decreasing, has slope minus one, and the intercept is um, uh, uh, the x-intercept, right? On the, on the axis there is, is, is it theta i, right? So there's individual heterogeneity here that different people have different theta i, okay? And then there is a pure effect, and phi measures the marginal rate of substitution between the pure effect and the private cost, if you want to think about it that way. I do. Um, and what is the pure effect? What I'm going to do is I am going to look at the quadratic distance, how far I am right, from what the average of my peers are doing, weighted according to the weights that I place on these individuals, how much I care about what they're up to. OK? All right, is this clear? This is a pretty simple model. So um, this is a game which um, uh, I have had my undergraduate solve in my undergraduate game theory class. It's not hard. Um, and one nice thing is that it has a unique equilibrium, by the way. Um, uh, uh, is that's really easy to show. Um, the other thing, actually, that turns out to be the case is depending upon what you assume about z, you can get into some very interesting airy-fairy game theory discussions about common knowledge and higher order beliefs and all of that, um, which um, uh, I won't talk about. But I have to say it just really excited me because, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who likes that. Um, and. Um, uh, and now what I'm going to do furthermore is I want to unpack this thing theta i, okay? I want, to, I want to talk about this marginal cost, and I'm going to relate it to all these things we had before. In particular, theta i is going to be uh, a linear combination of my own effect, which is here, um, this contextual effect, this is what we had before, and then also my idiosyncratic um, uh, 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 private type. That should be a zi. OK? Um, all right. And, and, and so this is all stuff that we've talked about. So this is the model. OK? And now um, one does the, you know, the usual machinations, find the equilibrium. And it turned out that the equilibrium um, can be, re one can actually solve directly for the equilibrium. And out of, so what the, what the game theoretic model delivers right, is a function for every individual that says what omega that person is going to choose 
as a function of right their own private their own public type everybody else's public type and their own private type okay so it actually gives you the reduced form okay that's what the strategy of the game is right is what is the strategy for an incomplete information game it maps types into actions for each people for each person each people each person okay that's what it does and um, uh, and um, uh, and, 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 and that looks a lot, that, that is what we often call the reduced form, but if you think about the structural equations as being what theory delivers, well, what theory delivers is omega as a function of x and z, okay? Um, but I'm going to rewrite it <coughs> um, this way here, um, <coughs> so you, could, you can actually... Um, uh, as long as we, oh, by the way, I, I forgot to say that we're going to assume, we're, going to, we're doing, comp, we're, we're, what we're doing here is we want pure, we're not looking for negative pure effects, right? So I'm going to assume that, that, that phi, back in this utility function here, is either zero or positive, that this is a non-negative parameter, right? And so the magnitude, when phi is zero, I'm not influenced by anybody. The greater phi, the more I'm influenced by other people, okay? And, um, um, and this matrix, I minus phi divided by one plus phi times A, this is an invertible matrix. Okay, um, and, and, uh, uh, and consequently, you can solve for omega as a function of x. This is the vector of omegas as a function of all of the x's, right? And that is the, um, uh, and that in fact is the, um, uh, the equilibrium strategy when you do that for everybody, when the equilibrium strategy profile. So notice again that we're back, we have an equation that looks like the general linear equation. So now I want to, so what constraints on the general linear equation that we have here, what constraints does theory deliver? Okay. Um, well, what this says, so remember the constraints in the model are that all the AII, all the CII have to be equal to zero. The row sums of the, of the, um, uh, of the A matrix and the row sums of the C matrix all have to equal one and a constraint that I forgot to write down that phi has to be non-negative. Okay, that's what theory delivers. Okay, now how does that translate into constraints on the econometric model? Okay, well it tells us that the diagonals of, uh, gamma, uh, of the gamma matrix, the diagonals are all one plus phi. Okay, um, it tells us that the sum, the row sum of um, everything but the, uh, actually what it tells us is that the row sum of the, of, of the gamma matrix is one. Okay, um, it tells us that um, delta ii, the diagonals are all equal here to minus the quantity gamma plus delta. And it also tells us again that the row sums of this are equal to, well, it's a, the row sums of everything other than, uh, of delta for everything other than person i, they're all equal to delta, okay? Now one, one final thing I should say is that if you look at the reduced form, um, gamma plus delta is identified by the reduced form. If you run the regression, of omega against x, um, uh, that identifies gamma plus delta, right? And so I already know all these diagonal entries. I know what they are, okay, um, by, running that, by, by running that regression. So the identification question comes down to saying, given these constraints, right, can I, can I in fact now identify the parameters of the utility function, okay? Now, um, all right. So um, first off, I, 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 I'll say a couple of things. A lot of social network stuff is done by assuming, right, that people know the C matrix and the A matrix. So for example, in the linear and means model, right, we know um, uh, that everything is equal to one over N or one over N minus one, okay? We assume these things at the outset. Now it seems to me that this is a real big problem, right, for doing empirical social network research because how do you ever observe the network, okay? So whenever we talk about observing the network, immediately everybody jumps to add health, right? Because it's, it's one of the few data sets out there that does this, right? And then, you know, what did add health do? They asked you to list, was it five or seven friends? Something like this? It was five. Five, right? Yes, five of each gender, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the point in just a moment that this was exactly the wrong question to ask. Okay, now let me tell you why it was exactly, this is going to be obvious, to, the minute I say it, it's going to be obvious to all of you. When you want to identify a linear equation system, what kind of constraints do you, what kind of conditions do you look for? 
You've all had econometrics. What did you learn in econometrics about identifying linear systems? You look for zeros, right? You look for exclusion restrictions, right? Exclusion restrictions are who's not your friend? That's what you want to know. You wanted to ask these kids, who in this high school do you not know? That's the right question to ask. That helps for identification, right? What they did was to say, tell me some of the coefficients in the A matrix that are not zero. But knowing something is not zero is not particularly helpful. What's helpful is knowing what is zero, right? So they blew it. Sociologists, what'd you expect, right? Okay. I'm really serious, right? That, that, for what we want to do, right, if you want to trace out the network, if all you want to do is trace out the network, which is, by the way, largely what sociologists are interested in, if you actually want to look at the social relations and plot them out, then asking who are you friends with, right, that's the right question to ask. If you actually want to study action on the network, knowing who you are not influenced by is much more important than knowing who you are influenced by because it gives you exclusion restrictions. Okay, does this make sense? Right, okay. Um, so when you are out there designing a study someday, right, millions of dollars at your disposal, remember what I said. Okay, please. Okay. Um, uh, and and um, uh, so in any event, okay, um, now, now, so let me continue on with my complaint. My complaint is, is that, uh, I'm not going to take a question for a, for a little bit, okay? My, 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 com my complaint is that, is, that, is that very often I know very little about A. And for that matter, I might, know, I might be willing to assume something about C. I mean, I like this public good model that just says that anything that hits the classroom, you know, hits all of us. But there are other circumstances where I don't even know C, okay? By the way, men, most studies actually assume that A and C are the same thing. Now, I think that that's actually a little bit crazy when you think that, that um, in the context of a classroom, you say that someone's parents give something to the classroom, and it only has an impact on me if that kid is, 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 is a friend of mine. Now, in the linear and means model, this doesn't matter because you're assuming straight averages for everything, right? But no one thinks that everybody is equally friendly with every other kid in the high school, right? That doesn't happen, right? So, so that's kind of a silly model, right? Um, but on the other hand, why did we do the linear and means model? Basically because we didn't know what else to do. You had to do something, right? And you had to make some kind of assumptions. So what I want to do now is I want to ask the question, well, how far can I go if I don't know anything at all about the network? Well, if I don't know anything at all about the network, I have to say that I'm sunk, okay? If all I know is this, okay, I really can't go very far. So the question is, what more do I need to know Right, in order to be able to start identifying the utility parameters in the model. Okay? Um, well, so the obvious thing you should do, you've all had econometrics, you say, okay, what, is the, what does the order condition say? Right? It's a general linear system, the order condition applies. What does the rank condition say? All right? Well, the order, condition says the order condition says the following. It says, and this is now a necessary condition for identification. What it says is that if the number of people who I am not linked to, and by the way, in this statement, I'm going to double count people, okay? Look at the number of people who I am not connected to through the peer effect. Look at the number of people that I am not connected to, okay, through the, um, uh, 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 through the uh, uh, contextual effect. If that sum is at least n minus 1, okay, then I have satisfied a necessary condition. Okay, for identification. All right. Furthermore, now, now what I'm, I, 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 I've gone too fast. What I want to say is that, is that I should go back and say that in order to identify, um, in order, I want the utility parameters. Okay, if I want the utility parameters, I can get, as you can see by looking at the bottom thing, I, the bottom set of restrictions, I can get everything off of the utility, all the utility parameters just by identifying one equation. Okay. So I'm going to ask the classic identification question. How do I identify one equation in the general linear model? All right, and the answer to that turns out to be this condition. Let's suppose that I want to identify the equation for person number one, okay? If, in fact, the number of people that he is not connected to in one matrix, in one network or the other, double counting people. So if you're not connected to me in any way, it counts twice, okay? Um, then, in fact, um, uh, if, if, if there's at least n minus 1 people that I'm not connected to, um, then I've, that's a, a necessary co sufficient, uh, condition for identification. Furthermore, 
right? It turns out that, that generically among social matrices for which the, the order condition is satisfied, the rank condition is satisfied as well. And therefore, for the generic social matrix, A and C, pair A and C, this model will be identified. It's a little slightly, if you read the theorem here, it's slightly trickier than that, but not terribly tricky, okay? Um, the set of weird matrices will depend upon gamma and delta, but if I can actually identify two equations, then um, in fact, the set of weird matrices will A be lower dimensional still, and, and not depend upon gamma and delta at all. And, um, um, and then one can actually push on. Right? So what I find interesting about, you know, I, I have spent some time writing a number of papers with Stephen Durloff about, about um, um, uh, uh, social interaction models and, um, uh, and, um, uh, and how to estimate them. Um, and we've done all these fancy things and talked about, and it, it, it turns out there are conditions under which you can actually identify, if you know the contextual effects matrix, you can identify the peer effects relationships, which is a little bit surprising. Um, um, all kinds of things you know, but, but, and we did all this fancy stuff in order to prove it, but what's really interesting is that if you go back to classical econometrics, like what you learned you know, in your first year class, it actually gives a very, a very interesting answer to this question. Now, um, what this says basically is that if you, imagine that you have a large school with several classrooms, right? If you have a large school with several classrooms, this says that you're gonna be able to identify the utility parameters, all right? Um, if, you think the class, if you think, for example, that classroom effects are, are, are um, the contextual effects are constrained to classrooms, and if the social networks are not too dense, right? If the peer effects network is not too dense, then the then the um, uh, the identification condition will be met. Okay. Now it turns out that this is really overkill. I, you know, I, I, I the rank condition is said to be necessary and sufficient for identifying equations, right? But if you go back and look at here, you can see that I don't actually need to identify a whole equation in order to, um, uh, in order to um, uh, get at the utility parameters. I need to identify only the diagonal elements, okay? And I already know this, and so I just need to identify this sum, and that's all I need to identify, right? So I actually don't need to know the whole equation, right? I only need to know parts of the whole equation. Um, furthermore, the only thing I've taken advantage of here are the, are, the, um, um, are, are the constraints in the equations that I'm estimating. But you'll notice that we also have these other conditions that all these diagonal terms have to be equal. So we have all these cross equation parameter restrictions. Okay? Here we have more cross equation parameter restrictions. Okay? Um, so um, uh, again, um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I've actually left on the table here. Right? Um, and it turns out that, that, that you know, so, so this is a, a, an interesting research question because I have scoured the econometrics literature and um, what one can find about identification in the linear model when you have cross equation restrictions is a bit sparse. There's not that much, right? Um, but I think, that there's, I think that there's easy stuff left to do here. So I, I think, in fact, one can get identification under much weaker conditions even than what I've described so far. Um, so, um, uh, if you actually know the social matrices, okay, um, so the typical model assumes that the pure effects and contextual effects matrices are the same. If you assume that they are the same, the only social matrix for which you cannot identify the model, uh, the utility parameters, is one in which the social network has one or more cliques. If it has more than one clique, all cliques are the same size, and everybody puts equal weight on everybody else in the clique, okay? Which is to say, the linear and means model for each clique, and furthermore, all the cliques are the same size. If that condition is not satisfied, the model is identified. So basically, Chuck Mansky's reflections paper, very nice, rip it up, throw it away. You know, it's being taped, oh dear. <laughs> Chuck, I didn't say that, no. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, uh, so so, so um, Maskey's paper, in fact, was very important because, interestingly enough, people had been estimating this model since the late 70s or early 80s, but it wasn't until 95 when anybody came along and said, hey, are these parameters identified? 
right? In fact, it wasn't until 85 that anybody, until 95, that anybody even wrote down a rudimentary structural model within which one could ask the identification question, okay? So, um, you know, like people, what were you thinking for 13 years? Uh, I, you know, I mean, this is the stuff we teach all the time, right? Everything begins with identification. So how come it took 13 years for somebody to ask if this model, by which time there were hundreds of papers using it, to ask if, if, if what we cared about was identified? This is remarkable. Um, and so anyway, so Chuck's paper was very important. And, um, um, but it turns out that the answer that he provided us was very specific to the particular version of the model that he wrote down. All right. Um, other ways of doing this, okay? Um, you know, what I did here was basically to assume that it's sums that matter. I care about the average, right? Well, there's many other ways in which you might think that pure effects can actually work. Um, so here's a bunch of, 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 of uh, examples. These come actually from a paper written by Carolyn Hoxby, um, who writes a lot on, on the economics of education. Um, and, and these names, I think, are her names. The bad apple, right? Um, this is a complementarity story where the worst student does enormous harm. Um, the shining light model has a single student with sterling outcomes, and this is her language too, can inspire all others to raise their level of achievement. Um, uh, invidious comparison, outcomes are harmed by, you know, if you're doing well, you know, wow, I just kind of quit, you know, and so I don't do so well. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, and the uh, boutique is boutique, what can you say, okay? So these are all different models of social interaction. Um, and if you want to study them, right, um, you could take any one of them and go through the same identification exercise that I just went through. Um, now, the, the model that, and, 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 and furthermore, to identify among them, of course, you have to do this multiple times. Um, the model that, the reason why you want to have a structural model, you know, to start with a theoretical model, is not just so that you can get restrictions for identification, but it's so that you can actually ask questions about the model, right? So suppose, for example, um, that I, uh, um, that I uh, uh, give everybody in the classroom a grant of a certain amount of money, okay? What happens to educational outcomes, right? Or what happens if I provide a little bit of, of, of more of the public good? What happens to outcomes, right? Well, I actually need a model to actually compute the, if I want to ask the welfare question for policy, Right? then I need a model that has utility functions running around in it in order to do that, right? Okay, so um, I don't see how you get policy conclusions out of a model because it's, it's, it's not sufficient to say that omega goes up because after all, it's possible for, omega, for people to overinvest in omega as well, right? There is a cost, right? And you might not want to, and, and if you, it's possible to over-remediate just as it is possible by using tax schemes, for example, to provide too much of a public good, right? So there's a deep question here. Now, the interesting thing to do, which I haven't done, and which I would, you know, I, I, I plan on doing at some point, but I hope one of you sends me a paper on the topic before I do it, is to say, well, suppose that I don't know the network. If I don't know the network, right, then I actually can't know what the welfare effects are, even if I can estimate the, um, utility parameters. But suppose that I have estimated the utility parameters. I can certainly get bounds, right, on the welfare effects. I can think about, well, what's the worst network for a good welfare outcome? What's the best network for a good welfare outcome, right? I can, and, 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 and so I could actually compute, um, I could do some kind of welfare economic partial identification, right? I might be able to say, well, even in the worst case, there's a welfare improvement, right? Um, or, or, um, or, or to say something about, about the range of possible welfare increases. So this, I, I think, is a very interesting line of research, which I also don't think it's very hard because it's just all quadratic forms. Yes? And if you know the utility functions, would you be able to back out the network? Well, actually, um, with a little bit more information, so the information that I assumed that you had here, right, was that you actually knew, you, you don't know the network itself, but you know where the zeros are. So, so, so um, you know, I, I know that there's a bunch of zeros, but, but if you and I are, you know, but, but if you two are friends, I don't know how much that influences. But if you're not friends, and, and I don't have to know, by the way, all the zeros, I only need to know some of the zeros, all right? So, um, uh, um, now if I actually knew the pure effects, if I knew the contextual effects matrix, it actually turns out that I can, in general, identify the pure effects matrix, okay? Um, and, 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 and that, of course, would actually be a, um, 
um, uh, a big, uh, that, that would actually then pin down all the welfare stuff, right? So I haven't, I haven't done any of those things yet. But, but uh, um, as I say, I think, I, think they're, 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 I think they're pretty easy, and I think it's important, right? Because at the end of the day, the only reason why we want to do this, right, is for policy recommendations. We want to know how to intervene. And if you can do this exercise, right, this gets around the problem of endogeneity of the network, right? Because suppose the network reconfigures itself. Right? And then, you know, at the end of the day, right, what if, if, if I imagine that the network is reconfiguring itself, at the end of the day, right, um, my, my actions have to be in equilibrium given the network choices, you know, um, um, uh, given the network that's in place, right? So again, if I have these bounds, right, that actually, that actually um, um, uh, those bounds work even in the presence of, um, of uh, network endogeneity. So there's a very interesting research topic. Now, I think that I'm just about out of time. Uh, and, um, and this is carefully planned so that I don't have to actually talk about diffusion. I have a lot of game theory, right? Um, this ca social capital stuff is not so interesting. Um, I have a lot of game theory here. Um, there's the bonus. There it is, the centrality. OK. Someone said, am I going to talk about it? There it is. OK. There it goes. Um, now it's gone. Um, I really wanted to talk about Bayesian learning on networks because, after all, the world expert on Bayesian learning on networks was sitting right here, um, uh, uh, Sanjeev uh, and, and, and his uh, classmate, uh, uh, Venki Bala, wrote this lovely paper, which appears in the um, Review of Economic Studies. Um, and I encourage you all to take a look at it, since I'm not going to talk about it. Um, common knowledge rears its ugly head. Um, OK. Uh, and I was going to talk again about diffusion and, 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 and diffusion. Uh, uh, so let me say one thing about that, and then I will stop. So the model that is, that is, that is um, in the literature um, and has been in the literature since, I, I think, the mid-'90s um, um, goes something like this. Imagine that you have a network and that people are playing some kind of coordination game on the network. right? Um, and you might think about this as a. Um, this same story, by the way, works for things like technology diffusion and stuff like that. But let me s stick with the coordination game. So here's a very simple story. Okay? I have a cho to choose an action, either A or B. Now I choose this action, and I've got all these neighbors on the network. Okay? I have all these neighbors, and, and, and I'm going to get a payoff from each action, from, from, from every neighbor, from interacting with every neighbor, which depends upon what I've chosen and what everybody else chooses. Okay? And it's going to be the sum of those. That's going to be my payoff. Okay. Now, um, uh, the question I want to ask is: Let's suppose that that, um, as you know, is often the case in coordination games. Um, one, there'll be there'll be two pure strategy equilibria, and one might be very good, and the other one might be less good, right? And then there's a mixed equilibrium, which really stinks, but we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Um, so maybe we're going to start in this situation where everybody is doing right the less good thing. Okay, and now the question we want to ask is, if we seed some of the good behavior somewhere on the network in some way, will it spread? Okay, um, and, and, and I planned on talking about that a little bit if there was time, but I knew there wouldn't be time, um, very strategic. Um, so um, uh, uh, the history of that, and I think it's a very important problem. So the history of that problem is the following. I wrote a paper on that, which I published in Games and Economic Behavior in 1995 on lattices. So the network is a lattice. Then I thought to myself, well, how could you do this in a general graph? And I have no idea. Okay? So I put the problem down. And then Steve Morris comes along, and he writes a paper, which is in the Review of Economic Studies, which does it on general graphs. And the paper is really long, and there's this very complicated proof and all that, and it's a really lovely paper. Okay? Um, years go by, and then John Kleinberg thinks about this problem while he's writing this textbook with David Easley. And he reduces the whole thing to a half paragraph proof. Okay? Uh, <laughs> that's what it's like working with John Kleinberg. It's like routinely feeling stupid. And, um, uh, and, and, and so, I want to, so I think this is a very important problem. The discussion of this problem in their textbook is lovely. Okay? And it's, it's, by the way, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, for those of you who are nascent historians of science, you're all too young for this. But if you are, it's interesting to see the arc of this particular topic. Okay? And, 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 and how it went from, from simple but silly to complex and powerful to simple and powerful. Okay? Um, and it's, a, it's, it's nice to watch. And, and, and um, 
So in any event, um, I want to encourage you to read that. And I should say that I actually, instead of rethinking this problem from new, even though I, uh, even though I published on it, I just said, well, gee, what's in the textbook, right? And that's where I got my notes from. So um, uh, you, should, you should just read that. Um, and uh, beyond that, I don't really, I, there's a lot more I could talk about, but uh, I stand between you and punting, mm -hmm. okay? And I wouldn't want to do that, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.